are problems that we call undecidable. There's no program anywhere mechanically that can figure out the answer to these questions in general. No algorithms to figure out the answers. This is a blueprint for the course. Now I should say, as we get into more detail, this blueprint will become more refined. There are subcircles. There are sometimes overlapping circles. There are all sorts of other relationships between these levels. Inside the Turing machine level itself, there are hierarchies. P and NP are both inside the Turing machine level. Okay, if I made another subcircle, P would be on the inside, NP would be on the outside. There's a whole hierarchy of complexity theory that takes place here. All the applications to compiler design take place here. And all the applications with finite state machines take place here. But it's this hierarchy that will give you a blueprint for the class. These are all machines except the outer layer? Yes, they all represent machines with different amounts of power. And, well, you'll see that there's different ways of actually describing languages. One way is by a machine. Another way is by a grammar. And a third way, and it works only on some levels, is by something called expressions. So there's different ways of describing these classes of sets of strings or languages. But you can think of it for sure as just more powerful machines going up the line. This level in particular is going to be split into two. It turns out that the two levels that this splits into end up not giving any extra power in these levels. In other words, there's an extra booster arm that you can throw into finite state machines. But it turns out not to give it any extra power. You know, it's like if somebody runs a marathon in four hours and you give them lots of extra carbohydrates before, so they'll run the marathon in 350, but it's not going to make them a really better marathon runner. So they stay the same, they're just a little faster. But in this level, if you throw in a little bit of extra power, you actually end up gaining new languages that you couldn't do before. And it splits the set into two. Back in this level, when you throw in that extra bit, things stay the same again. So this level will get partitioned later on. Whee! All right. So it's time to get down to some more specifics. OK, let's start down here. You've all seen finite state machines before. I'm going to pretend you never have. And I'm going to teach them like I always teach them. You're going to read the book. The book has tons of formalism, even though it's a very nice, intuitive book. There's lots of ideas behind the proofs. Nevertheless, to write a real book for this stuff, you have to be very careful. Make sure you don't say anything vague. That's exactly the opposite of what's going to happen in class. I can say all the vague things I want because I want to give you the idea of what's really going on. And if you want to find out the real nitty gritty detail, and if I say something that isn't 100% completely rigorous, it's right there for you to check. And I, just ask me a question too because I know all the rigor behind it. But it's just really bad to teach this course by, by going toward rigor. Uh, some of you might have remembered some of the speakers we had during this year, one of whom particularly talked about this stuff. And, and did exactly that. And it just, it seems much more difficult than it really needs to be. So I'm going to explain what a finite state machine is by showing you an example and then pointing out in the example what the real traits are. So let's, let's start with an example. Let's start with strings that have an even number of zeros, binary strings that have an even number of zeros. I should mention, uh, our sets of strings that we're talking about, they don't have to be over the alphabet 0, 1. Right? I mean, Java programs are over an alphabet of of a to z, and 0 dot dash up to 9, and commas, and semicolons, and various other things, parentheses, closed parentheses. So this alphabet can be very large. But for the purposes of understanding the abstractions and what's really going on in this class, we hardly ever need to consider alphabets that are more than two symbols. Two symbols kind of gives you this exponential help over one symbol. And after that, it's just convenience. So we'll always assume that it's binary strings unless I say otherwise. So we want to consider the set of strings that have an even number of zeros, a set of binary strings with an even number of zeros. And we're going to describe these things called finite state machines by actually doing it for this, for this problem. So here's what a finite state machine looks like. It has states. The states represent some kind of memory about the problem that you're dealing with. If you want an intuition for what can be done with a finite state machine, it's anything you can do and solve by remembering a finite amount of information. 
If you use that gut instinct rule, you'll be able to almost triage any set and say yes or no, it can be done with a finite state machine or not. If you ask yourself, can I write a program for this using a finite amount of memory? Could I figure out how to do this storing a finite amount of information? So in this case, I want to give you a sense of how to do the design of finite state machines. This is going to be an easy one, but there's plenty of hard ones. You really want to get a semantic meaning to each state. So this state will be things with an even number of zeros. And I have another state that will be an odd number of zeros. And we're going to start here, meaning that before we've seen any symbols of the string that we're considering, we now have an even number of zeros, namely zero zeros. We haven't seen anything yet. And now the machine is going to, imagine the machine looks like this. It's over here, and then there's a little tape here that has a particular string on it. 010111. So this should be accepted. It should say yes. The machine is going to have a little head, a little arrow, a little head that looks at the symbol and moves strictly left to right across this tape. And as it moves, it moves from state to state. That's all it does. That's the simplest kind of computation you could possibly have. Remember a finite amount of things. Read your candidate string left to right and move back and forth. So let's put in what's called the transition function, the thing that tells us where to go as we see symbols. If we're in this state, we have an even number of zeros, and we see a zero, then we're going to switch over to that state. And what, ev what else might we see? We might see a 1 instead of a 0. What would we do then? Stay here. And that takes care of this state. In fact, every finite state machine should have exactly one arrow coming out of each state for each of the symbols in your alphabet. So in binary strings, you've got two arrows coming out. And now you move on to the next state. And in fact, if you structure your design of finite state machines in this way, actually writing the states down first without any arrows, modeling the problem semantically by giving information in the states, and then only later filling in the arrows, you will have a much, much easier time doing it. And if you have trouble deciding what information needs to go in the states, that's where you should stop and think, and not after first putting in some arrows, because that will just get you on, perhaps on the wrong track. All right, so who can fill the rest of this in for me? Smiley Donna? You give us a one, come back to yourself. Done. You give a zero, go back to yourself. Good. All right, this is 80% of a finite state machine. This arrow indicates that I start here in this state. There's one state that is uniquely given as the start state. That tells me where I begin. These arrows tell me where I go based on different symbols. And there's one more piece of information, and that is a set of final states. A subset of these states where if I actually end up there when I'm finished reading the string, tell me that I accept it and I say yes. And if I end up in the non-final states, I say no. And the way to indicate final states in my notation, and I'm pretty sure the book does the same thing, is just to put a double circle around the state. So that's this one. That's a complete finite state machine. This accepts all binary strings that have an even number of zeros, and it rejects all binary strings that don't have an even number of zeros. And we can run it. 0, 1, 0, 1, 1, 1. I end up here. I look at the double circle. I say, we, I accept. And that string is a yes. All right, other questions so far? Who's got it? Too easy? So far, too easy? Good. <coughs> Nothing like too easy. Depends on whether you're the book or not, I guess. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. Are going to be yes, no answers, except rejection? Yes. All yes, no answers. Yes. There is issues of, of complexity. It's not that the other questions aren't interesting. It's just that let's, let's solve these questions first, because they're hard enough. It's hard enough just to deal with computation with yes or no. And then later on, we can put in the issue of actually outputting something because we do do that later on at the Turing machine level. In fact, you might remember in the computer architecture course, they talked about the versions of finite state machines that actually have output. Mm -hmm. Mealy machines and more machines. Does that ring a bell? OK, so there are versions of this that have output. And sometimes in a course like this, you know, they get thrown into the exercises as, hey, somebody uses this for some neat application. But you've seen that application already. And, uh, and for the most part, we don't need to to discuss it as far as the material in this class goes. We're, we're going to stay away from output on finite state machines. They just say yes or no. All right, so we're going to do a few more examples of this. And 
an even number of ones.